very bumpy, but that's the way it goes the day after a storm. So you look at the blue skies, it is what it is. But an interesting little tidbit is very commonly the day after a storm or rain, even if it's absolutely beautiful looking conditions, it's going to be bumpy pretty much every time. It's not that big of a deal, just something to mental note. The, uh, that it's usually bumpy the day after it rains, even if it's beautiful. It'll be the day after the day after, and generally you'll get back to smooth air. Kind of interesting little tidbit. Just comes from experience. So weather to fly in. What weather is okay to fly in? Or okay and safe to fly in? Well, if, now this is a big if, if you have super skills and can kite up a wall or say kite on a post and you have a flat top and dominator, then you can pretty much fly safely whenever the freak you want in anything but bad weather. So, and well, you can even fly in bad weather. It just wouldn't be much fun. I mean, I could literally go out on a day of 35 mile an hour winds and I could fly safely. The, you know, you're taking a little more risk in lunacy conditions, but not as much as you might think. But if you don't have the skills and that specific gear, you're gonna die. It's a whole different world because a paraglider gets the vast majority of its stability from the pilot. It's the pilot. If the glider surged forward and you do nothing and let it go to a negative angle of attack, well, of course it's gonna collapse. That's what you told it to do. And a glider's ability to collapse is one of the reasons it's so safe. Most people don't know this, but if you fly a hang glider that has the aluminum tubes where it can't collapse, unless you fold it in half and die, the, uh, and you get hit with say a 40 mile an hour crazy gust or something. That hang glider can't collapse. It can get flipped into an attitude that's unrecoverable and people die that way. Where with a paraglider, a properly designed paraglider like the Dominator, you could get slammed by that same gust and it can absorb that energy by collapsing and then just pop right back out and keep on flying all while staying above you, controlling your descent rate. Very, very important. So it's actually safer to have that paraglider be able to collapse. It's like the big blow up toys the kids jump up and down on in Playland. It absorbs the energy and then just pops right back out where it's supposed to be. If you have the right glider, if you fly some glider they call reflex, you're just gonna die, it's all there is to it. So that stability is very important and that safety, but most people, you know, are horrified. Oh my gosh, what if it collapses? Well, that's like, you know, worrying about things that don't make any sense. You just don't, simply don't understand how the sport works. It's not that big of a deal. Watch what happens when you collapse a Dominator. Well, here, I'll show you. Boom. Okay, what am I, 30 feet off the ground, 25 feet, and I just yanked an asymmetric club, and nothing happens. It keeps freaking flying. All right, let's see. I am like 15 feet off the ground, and major asymmetric. Add a little power, keep flying straight and level. Now, if you did that on an ozone glider, you would have pounded into the ground. Boom, dead. Totally different world, because if you yank a major asymmetric collapse on even a large, it will sink so fast, not even full throttle on an extremely powerful paramotor will keep it in the sky. Uh, you can watch my video where I did the ozone versus the dominator test, ozone Indy, their certified glider, which, yeah, it pops out without turning the specified amount to make that certification, but what they don't tell you is that when it collapses, you sink so fast that not even adding throttle will keep you in the sky. You will literally plummet out of the sky like a freaking rock. And it takes much, much longer to pop out. Where the Dominator, I mean, the, it pops out like so fast, you, you'll almost never see a collapse. Because by time you look up, you feel it collapse. You look up, boom, it's already open. Dominator, baby. That's why we fly them. 
I mean, the best pilot in the world doesn't fly Dominators because I rolled the dice and said, oh, I'm gonna promote this one and maybe I'll just tell everybody to buy that one. I mean, are you freaking kidding me? Now that's a common lie that people tell and try and go, oh, he, he tells, he says that because he sells that and then bashes anything he doesn't sell. Um, we're Paraglider Mall. We sell all makes and models and can sell every brand on the market. <laughs> So yeah, no, I sell those too, or I can sell the death traps. I just choose to be honest. So the gear and the skills has a huge impact on the safety, obviously. Now, what conditions can you fly in? It's really not about what conditions can a skilled pilot with quality gear fly in. It's about if you don't have skills and gear, you shouldn't freaking be flying. Hello, you shouldn't fly. It's not a, oh, what conditions is it safe for you to fly in? No, it's not safe. If you don't have super skills and the right gear, you shouldn't be flying at all, period, in any conditions. Never ever try and get in the air on an aircraft you don't actually have the ability to control because that would be sheer stupidity. That's just dumb. There's no reason for it. There's no logical reason when it's so simple, you just go through 10, 10 days of super training and you can literally come out of there with upwards of 530 flights of experience and go from you know an extra large clear down to an extra, 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 extra small. So that's more the real honest answer is it's not about what conditions are safe to fly in. It's are you a pilot with proper gear or are you not? And there should be no BS to it. Either you can show that you can do what brand new super students can do, or you can. You can or you can't. There's no opinion to it. It's skill. You either have the skill or you don't have the skill. Do you have the skill or not? If you don't have the skill, you shouldn't be flying at all, period, ever. If you have the skill, you can pretty much fly whatever the freak you want. Middle of the day, 100 degree temperatures, you know, it is it is what it is. Now, there can be severely violent conditions. I mean, if you chose to fly in the middle of the day in Phoenix, Arizona, in 130 degree temperatures, well, you're gonna get a booty whooping. You know, be prepared for that. Can you do it? Yeah, I've done it. <laughs> and I got a booty whooping, so I prefer not to do that. But did I die? No. Did I take massive collapses? No. Active piloting, proper skills, proper gear. I can fly in the middle of the day in Arizona. It's just, you know, you know it's your focus is on staying you know, alive and keeping the glider open as opposed to your focus being on screwing around and making a video talking and explaining things. So there are conditions that I would rather not fly in. It doesn't mean I can't, I absolutely could. If I need to go find my lost child, freak yeah, I'm gonna take off. I don't give a crap if it's in the middle of Arizona. I will fly because I have the skill and the gear to do it safely even if I do have to active pilot the crap out of the glider. Like when I set the Paramotor World Distance Record, unlimited fuel, 280 miles on three and a half gallons. At one point, I almost had to land because I was active piloting so vigorously, my arms were like almost at fatigue level where I couldn't physically continue doing it. So I was almost at the point where I had to physically land and then finally it got later in the evening where it started to chill out and I was able to relax <laughs> a bit and stop, you know, and actually keep flying to make the full 280 miles. So yeah, I never even took a collapse. No problem, flew right through conditions so violent that I was active piloting to the point where my body was so exhausted, I almost couldn't physically move my arms anymore. So what conditions can you fly in? Well, you can fly in any conditions you freaking want to. Do you want to get your butt rock around? Or do you want to just play around low to the ground and have some fun? Obviously, if you got crazy insane conditions, the first thing you're gonna do, boom, hit throttle, get away from the ground. Duh. That's part of being a pilot. 
It's it's not about you know being an idiot. It's about what conditions can a pilot fly in. If you're not a pilot and don't have super skills and a flat top and a dominator, don't fly. <laughs> Period. Until you do, it's just not worth it to roll the dice with your life when you have a guarantee you're going to get a six. I mean, what are the, what are the odds if you keep rolling a dice that you're going to get a six? It's like one in six. <laughs> kind of makes sense, huh? So when I say you have a 100% chance of death flying crap, it's not a, you know, uh, it's not an exaggeration. It's a simple statistical surety, just like rolling a dice. What are the odds you're gonna take a collapse at some point over a lifetime of flying? 100%. If you fly a death trap glider, what's gonna happen when you took that collapse? It's gonna do a backflip 180 and lock you into a spiral face first into the ground, bam, dead. What are the odds of death? 100%. Bam, dead. I mean, it's not, it's statistics, you know, it's logic, it's reason. I actually aced analytical reasoning in college, must say, when I was 16. Yeah, I went to college when I was 16. Oh yeah. So the, uh, yeah, conditions you can fly in, it's kind of a stupid question. No, it, because the real, the real question is, do you have super skills? Do you have them or don't you? If you don't, don't fly until you do. Do you have proper gear? If you have a glider they call reflex, no, you do not. Now, if you have a certified A-class glider, do you have proper gear? Maybe, maybe not. You might not know because there's huge differences just because it, it opens without turning doesn't mean it doesn't plummet to the ground while doing it. So it's very, very critical to listen to the experience of an actual expert and not be a complete moron. Trying to, you know, trust your life to people that don't know what the heck they're doing. Again, don't trust your life to people who don't even have super skills. Hello? It should be pretty logical and obvious. So, now, does that mean that you come straight from super training and go fly in the middle of the desert? in 100 degree temperatures in the middle of the day. No, that's not what we're saying. Can you? Yeah, uh, it de depends on if you graduated super training. So taking super training doesn't guarantee you're gonna graduate. You actually have to pass the class. It's kind of an interesting thing there where you do actually have to gain the skills in order to pass. If you go through super training, you graduate and you've got some solid freaking skills does that mean you immediately go home and fly in the middle of the day no you work up to it slowly because there's a big difference between skill and experience big big difference so you want to gain experience and try and smooth things out take it easy at first you know, at training, we're gonna push it and try and push hard because I'm right there helping you, I'm picking the conditions, and I know you're gonna be safe because I'm making sure of it. But when you get back home, that's when you back it back down, you do only what you were taught to do, and you try and stick, you know, to smoother conditions or the odds, better odds of smoother conditions because there's no such thing as perfectly smooth air because conditions change. But you try and, you know, maybe fly earlier in the morning and then start pushing it later as you start gaining experience, you know, maybe fly till 9.30 a.m. and then you stop and then the next day maybe try, you know, maybe 9.35 and then you'll see what the thermals start feeling like and slowly over time you work up to feel it. You don't wanna just go out immediately and get slammed with violent conditions because while you might have the skills to deal with it, you might not have the stomach or balls for it. There, you know, at super training, we can teach skills, but there's also mental stability and confidence and a whole bunch of things that don't come naturally to a whole bunch of people. So you don't wanna go jump in the fire 
you know, because you might not be ready for it emotionally, it could flat out scare the living piss out of you if you're not prepared for or worked up for it. I mean, at super training, you're gonna kite in some hellacious conditions and you're gonna be able to keep that glider open. If you take, you know, if you're taking collapses, you don't fly. <laughs> you gotta be able to kite all freaking day and never, ever, ever take a collapse. If you don't have the skill to prevent those collapses, you have no business in the air. So you're gonna have skills by the time you graduate super train. There's no question about it. But there's a difference between skill and experience and mental stability and confidence and a whole different world to it. So you wanna work up to things slowly, not go right out and fly in a freaking hurricane <coughs> when you just don't have the experience to understand the sure, you know, the sheer violence of what it's like. Because if you get mentally rattled, suddenly those skills can go right out the window, boom, and all of a sudden you start doing stupid stuff and over controlling and panicking if you don't have all those pieces together. So there's a lot more to it than you might think. This is just seriously fun. So, basically, <coughs> you know, look at the statistics. If you get super training and a flat top and a dominator, and if you don't do anything completely retarded, nobody's ever died in the history of the sport. Actually, I don't know of anyone who's ever even been injured in the history of the sport, uh, given those scenarios. Now, have people been injured on flat tops? Yup, about a handful. Every single one of them did something ridiculously stupid, and they will be the first one to admit it. Or, well, yeah, I, I mean, I, I've talked to all of them, because who do they come to for parts to repair their gear? Well, me, they, so I hear about all of them. And so it's pretty obvious you know, that people do something stupid. If you come out home from super training and then immediately on your third flight try and go do a wingtip drag when you never were taught how to do that, that's, you know, chalk that up to doing something ridiculously stupid. Or just as bad, if you call me and go, hey, how do I do a wingtip drag? And I go, that's one of those things you absolutely do not do unless I walk you through it. And then you go do it the next day and crash, well, you can't count that as anything other than sheer stupidity. So, you know, if you do something sheerly stupid like that, then that really doesn't apply to someone who is not gonna do something sheerly stupid. You know, it's, aviation is not for sheer stupidity. You know, we all do our sheerly stupid things because we all have stupid moments, but there's a right way to work up to stupidity and there's a wrong way to be just ridiculously stupid. There's a big difference. So I've literally never been injured in my entire history in the sport. So while I do things nobody else on earth can do, I've built up to them very, very slowly over years of experience. And yeah, I've had oopsies, but they were small I mean, there's a big difference between missing by 50 feet and missing by four inches. Big, big difference. If you swing into the ground and you miss by 50 feet and hit face first straight down, well, you, you know, that's gonna be a little different than if you miss by say an inch or two and you crush the skids, you fly away, you have a bad landing, very different outcome. So if you're using a little brain power and don't do anything ridiculously stupid, you know, you can still have that stupid moment where you do something dumb or you make a mistake, but it shouldn't be a absurdly ridiculous mistake that would get you seriously injured or killed. The sport is remarkably, kind of ridiculously safe. The, and I'm the guy saying, <laughs> I've been doing this forever. The, I mean, if I was getting broken left and right, like I did on bullet bikes, then it would not, I would not say it's ridiculously safe. If you ride bullet bikes, it is ridiculously dangerous. Just to put that into perspective. 
Because when you make a simple mistake on a bullet bike and go down, it, the results are catastrophic. If you live, you're probably in intensive care for two weeks with 11 vertebrae fused together and a hip bolted on and a hand bolted together and a broken neck and a broken sacrum and broken every other bone that you can name. So big difference between that and flying around at 25 miles an hour with the 57 inch roll cage around you where even if you mess up, the odds are pretty slim that you're gonna get injured. So big, 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 big differences. So you, you gotta have a little bit of brain power. The really hard part is the stupid people don't know enough to listen. So like all of this explanation, it really doesn't do any good for an idiot because an idiot's gonna go train with some total moron that pretended they were gonna train him and they never even looked at their skill level. And then they'll call names to the best pilot in the world going, oh yeah, look, I'm so smart. It, it happens all the time, literally, I kid you not. People literally brag about training with idiots and I'm like, oh, wow, that's great, you, you got training. Okay, show me the skills that you got from that training. They're like, oh yeah, oh, yeah you just say that, but you talk crap about. I'm like, no, I'm not talking crap, I said show me the skills. Like, oh yeah, but sure, but yeah, you kicked it out. No, didn't kick it out. You know, sorry, that's a lie. But hey, how about just show me the skills? I'd love to see these skills that you acquired through your training. <laughs> it's just, it's laughable. It's like sheer stupidity, you know, arguing with someone that has skills trying to save their life. It, it, you know, it's not my life I'm trying to save by doing this video. It's yours. Here I am talking for an hour just trying to save your life. That's why I'm doing it. Shoot, I built the fourth largest computer retailer in the Western US and retired when I was 30. I don't have to be sitting here talking. I'm talking for you because I love you and I don't want you to die. And I love the sport and I wanna share the fun of it with you. But the fun only comes after the work. You get the training, you get the right gear. If you can't afford it, don't freaking do it. Don't think you're gonna go out and Mickey Mouse together some piece of crap and buy something off of eBay and then self-train. That just, you know, might as well just hang a sign around your neck that says, I'm stupid, stay away from me. You know, it, a lot of people really should wear a stupid sign. It, it, I don't know if you heard that comedian, but it's, it's pretty funny, but it's pretty true. There, there's people that are dumb. This is, this is not the sport to dabble in. You either do it right 100% or don't do it, period, because it's gonna end very badly. And it's not much fun being in a wheelchair or breaking yourself up and never being able to fly again and having pain the rest of your life. Been there, done that on motorcycles. So you don't hear me encouraging kids to go jump on a bullet bike. Yeah, why am I not selling bullet bikes? Very, very fun, but the odds are you're going to mess up, and when you mess up, the results are very likely catastrophic or even deadly. Very different scenario. So, yeah, there's people that have ridden motorcycles for years who haven't crashed yet. <laughs> you know, but it's, it's a whole varying thing. It's when you crash, you know, at 70, 80 miles an hour and hit something with your body at that speed, it's not the same as hitting the ground at 10 miles an hour. I mean, if you full stall a dominator straight out of the sky, it only falls about 20 feet per second. It's like jumping out of a, off of a one story house roof, basically. So even if you stalled from 10,000 feet and the glider's wadded in a ball, it's still enough cloth up there to slow you down uh, to, you know, 20 feet per second, basically. Now, if you jump off a house roof and you land flat in your butt on the sidewalk, you're still gonna break your back or die. I mean, you jump off a house roof and land on your butt on the sidewalk, that is not going to end well. That's where 18 inches of crumple zone on the flat top comes into play. If you jump off that same house roof and you have 18 inches of crumple zone under your butt, well, the odds are you won't even be injured, let alone killed. It'd be like jumping off the house roof 
with a dirt bike that has 18 inches of suspension. Dirt bikes don't have 18 inches of suspension. Even six, seven, eight inches of suspension can absorb insane impacts. It's pretty incredible what you see some of the motocross guys do. So 18 inches of crumple zone is like a whole different world. That's like off-road race truck kind of territory. Some of those I don't even know have 18 inches of up travel. So it's you gotta have both though, because if you jump out of an airplane with no parachute, is 18 inches of crumple zone gonna save your life? No, it can do jack squat. It'll give them a aluminum cage to bury you in. It's the speeds. So it's not enough to just fly a flat top. It's not enough to just fly a dominator because you fly a dominator with some pile of crap unit like a Scout or Fly Products or Black that has a zero crumple zone. Well, now you're jumping off a house roof if you smacked into the ground and your butt hits first. So it's not enough to have a dominator and it's not enough to just have the flat top but fly a death trap glider that descends faster. You gotta have both. You gotta control the descent rate and have the crumple zone and have the skills. One, two, three. This is why you listen to people who fly way, 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 way over 11,000 flights pushing all the limits who have never been injured. You know, you don't get to that point without a little bit of logic, common sense, and rational thought process. <laughs> it doesn't work that way because you don't li live long enough to actually get to that point. So big, big differences. It is a very, very cool sport as long as you listen to Superdale. Listen to the guy that has the experience. The, that's the, I mean, it's like, I don't charge one penny for my advice. Here I am giving you advice and input for less than free. It's like save your life and you didn't pay anything for it. I'm actually saving you time and money and life for nothing. It's very, very simplistic. So it just makes sense to get input and have all of that experience working in your favor. Where if you go to Joe Jimmy Bob, you know, who thinks he's an instructor, who can't even do what a brand new super student can do, and he's only been in the sport three, four years, he doesn't know jack squat. He doesn't understand what's gonna happen to you. He hasn't flown midday in Arizona in 120 degree temperatures, let alone through the mountains thousands and thousands and thousands of times in 100 plus degree temperatures. And he hasn't been hit by eight gust fronts or more and flown right through it. It just, there's a whole knowledge and understanding and experience level that simply does not exist with people that don't have the experience. So it's not, it's more than just skill. It's, it's the experience, the wisdom, the knowledge, the intelligence level of who you're talking to. And you gotta be brighter than a stump. But obviously none of this is gonna work on stupid people. It just, it doesn't. There's nothing you can do for those types of people. Those types of people are gonna go train with Aviator PPG or, 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 or somebody like Kurt Fister. No difference. Neither of them will train you. They'll just chuck you in the air with no training whatsoever. Think I'm kidding? Show me the video. It's a simple fact. That's what they do. You will get between zero and maybe three hours and of kiting and with no real instruction anyway, you're not gonna learn any skills because they don't even have the skills. They can't even do what a super student can do. So how are they gonna teach you to active pilot if they themselves don't even have those skills? It's just, it's, you know, again, it's people that just aren't so bright. They see how cool I make it look and how supers make it look. And then they think, oh yeah, I could just learn anywhere and go to some local Joe Blow. And it simply doesn't work that way. So make sure that, you know, when you're looking at skills, you verify and check and research who you're talking to and the skill level of who you're talking to and the skill level of the students that they've trained. Oh yeah, jumping over trees. There's just, it never gets old, man, jumping over trees. It's just seriously fun. Cause you just kind of rip around whoop, and notice I'm right in the rotor of that tree right now. Boop, 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 boop. Yep, felt it, but active piloting, dominator, whoop-de-doo, gives a crap. 
vents and never approach a fence at an altitude where a motor out could cause you to fly into it. That's why I climbed over it. Now here I'm over a road, so, and I'm kind of into the wind. As you can see, I'm going quite slow because we have a little wind into my face. So I have no problem flying low. What you won't see me do is flying low downwind over crazy rocky rough ground. I might do it once in a great while over a smooth surface where I could slide to a stop and it, you know, it'd be ugly but not that big of a deal, might fall down. But what you don't do is fly low to the ground downwind over a rough rocky surface where you're going to run into a pile of rocks at 60 miles an hour that you know you know do do the logic it's probably not gonna go so well to run into a pile of rocks yes yeah, 60 miles an hour you got a big tailwind and you're on a glider that does 40 it's you know it is what it is or 50 depending on how fast you're flying hoorah so you got to choose what you're doing fly low to the ground try and do it into the wind where if you did have a motor out you could just flare and land bam that's it now, you do want to avoid the death zone. What's the death zone? Well, there's, there's two of them, actually. Basically, the death zone is between 15 feet and about 50 feet. <laughs> because if you took a collapse in that area on a crappy glider, and you, you could possibly hit the ground before it recovered. And so, you want to be cognizant of that. I mean, I'm in a Dominator, so it doesn't bother me too much. So let's talk about the other one, because if you got a Dominator and super skills, you know, and you're an actual pilot who's been trained, you're gonna know not to fly at those altitudes in rougher air. Now, on launch or landing, you have to be at those altitudes, because you climb up past it and you climb out of it. Now, why am I flying so low? This altitude is actually safer than 10 feet off the ground. The reason is because at this altitude, if my motor were to die, I would just flare and land, bam, that's it. But if the motor dies at 10 feet, now the glider is gonna dive into the ground and I don't have the energy in the glider to actually round out and flare. You can, you're, you're gonna actually hit while rounding out in the flare. And so if your motor dies at 10 feet, it could be, you're gonna hit pretty hard. It's, that's the way it works. Now, the Dominator, depending on the size, the smaller the size, the higher you need to be. So with an extra, extra small, I'm gonna need to be, I mean, if I wanna be comfortable, again, it depends on the surface a bit, but save, about 20 feet or so. So let's watch here. Let's get straight and level. Try and get about 20 feet. And then motor dies. And boom. See at that? That was even just a touch low. So again, you gotta factor in altitude and stuff like that. Um, because when the motor dies, you're being pushed by that motor. As soon as that motor dies, the glider is going to dive to regain its airspeed. And so, depending on the glider and how far it dives, you've got to plan for that. Because if your motor were to die inside of that altitude where it's going to have to dive to regain its speed, then you're going to smack into the ground pretty dang hard. So, take a speed glider, for example. Now, a speed glider is really extreme. They will dive upwards of 80 feet to regain their speed. So if you're, you're flying a speed glider and your motor died at 30 feet, you are gonna pound into the ground insanely hard. Very, very ugly. Again, lots of factors, size of wing, where you're at, altitude, loading, weight, blah, blah, blah. So lots of factors, I'm just giving you the principle. But like right here at this altitude, if my motor dies, I'm gonna swing in, round out, flare, and boom. You can see I could have landed that very easily piece of cake, not even a challenge. Because I had just a little bit enough altitude to round out and regain that airspeed. So, flying! All kinds of cool little stuff that you just don't 
get from people that don't have that experience or understanding. I mean, how do I know about a speed glider? Because I ran and jumped one off of a 25 foot cliff. That was a freaking ugly experience. But it's, you see, without that vast, vast experience and knowledge, it's like that's, you know, you could learn it the hard way, like I did, or you could just listen to the guy who knows it. So you don't have to learn it the hard way. It's kind of cool to, you know, listen and gain from that experience so you don't have to go through it. But yeah, I got a brand new speed glider. I ran and jumped it off a 25 foot cliff. And of course, I was in the process of diving at the ground when I hit the ground and biffed it pretty good in the sand. Didn't get hurt, but I biffed it pretty good. Learned uh, the hard way uh, that speed gliders drop like a freaking rock. I mean, I thought that would have been, you know, that's like double what a normal paraglider would be in a normal size. Keep in mind, I'm on an extra, extra small up here at, you know, 46, 4,700 feet. So the weight factors and size all factor in there. But a speed glider isn't just twice as bad. It's like triple. <laughs> you got to like over triple it. If I need 25 feet on a Dominator, you're going to need 100 feet, you know, or 75, 80, 90 feet on a speed glider. Again, 80 feet was actually like at near sea level. So it's going to change depending on your altitude. So there's things like that, that you, you really want to test and learn. But a lot of that is going to be burned into your brain from super training because you're going to get upwards of 530 flights of experience with me personally walking you through every one of these little details until you literally just are doing it, you know, with, by reflexes without even having to think about it. Whole different world. So that's what training is. It's a transfer of knowledge and skills where you actually gain skills and knowledge. If you don't have any knowledge and skills, you didn't get trained. So very, very important, you know, that you understand the definition of the word training because there's a lot of people selling you swampland in Florida and, you know, it's like pretending they're selling training, but nobody's ever gained skills from them. Very, very bad. So you have to be careful of Joe Blow, Jimmy Bob's out there trying to pretend, oh yeah, these guys are great, blah, blah, blah. Well, how do you know? Show me the skills. Okay, well, that should ought to be enough chit-chatting for one day. This video is probably gonna be very, very long. So just stay tuned. If you want to get into the sport, you simply call me at 800-707-2525. 800-707-2525. And I will help you do it the right way and make it the best possible experience that we can by stacking all the odds in your favor with the right skills, the right training, and the right gear exactly from all of the experience of knowing how to do it like that. I mean, it's the exact same thing I do for my kids. I mean, if you notice, I'm gonna recommend for you exactly what I put my own children on. Same gear my wife flies, same glider, same training, same way they were trained, same, I mean, all my kids were trained at the beach. That's how it works. You train at the beach. So anyway, Superdell signing off. Have some fun and have a brain. And if you don't have a brain, stay out of the sport. Although I know you won't. It's the way it goes. So there you go. Crap happens. But let's go flying! Yeah, right in the rotor. Notice how slow I'm going. So the wind is really high. It's quite a bit of wind. And I'm right in the rotor of these trees and buildings and semis, active piloting, Woo down the dirt road, glider, you can see I'm kind of bouncing around from the rotor and turbines, woohoo, woohoo, it's active piloting, you can see my hands moving, constantly just fixing direction, pitch, loading, just constantly, four to five corrections per second, I mean, if you counted, 
do the math, you can probably watch the video and count and see how many times my hands are responding per second. It's quite a few. It takes extremely good training from someone that really actually knows what they're doing to actually train somebody properly like that. A building full of explosives in the middle of nowhere. Probably. 